And in terms of numbers, obviously we're more technologically advanced now, but in terms of the sheer size of the military, there are many militaries today that are not as big as the Maori military was back then in terms of people. There's 600,000 infantry, 30,000 cavalry, and 9,000 war elephants at their peak. Yeah, and one of the most important thing about the Mauryan Empire is that not only did they unify India, but that unification helped India resist uh, Greek and Macedonian invasions. As I don't know if you all remember Alexander the Great, he plays a huge role in the Mauryan Empire coming up. So before the Mauryan Empire was even created, India was still ruled by many, many little, little kingdoms. We were all broken up. Everyone had their own kingdoms. At one point, there was well over 500 different kingdoms that ruled India. When I, when I say India, I'm throwing the term a bit colloquially because back then they would say Bharat or later on it would say Hindustan. It meant, more, it meant India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, the entire subcontinent really. So the empire of Alexander the Great is really important because Alexander the Great is easily one of the most influential people that we've ever seen on the history of the world, as, at least in recent written times because he started out in Macedonia and he went out not only to conquer all the way up to the borders of India, but he completely demolished the Persian Empire that existed back then. And a lot of the reasons that he conquered and a lot of the consequences of his empire led to many cultural changes throughout the world. So the reason Alexander's exploits are important to India's story is mainly because as Alexander came and conquered into India, he set a chain of events that would eventually lead to the creation of the Mauryan Empire. So if we go back to Alexander's time, when Alexander first came to India, his intention was to sweep through India just as he did Persia. So Alexander's invasion of India happened before the rise of the Mauryan Empire. And Porus was there in Alexander's way. He was an empire, he was a small king actually. The kingdom he ruled was small. It was today's present day Punjab and it was in the north. So in order for Alexander to cross over and sweep through India, that, that was his plan at least, he first had to defeat Porus. Porus also had an Indian name, but the Greek records call him as Porus because that's closer to their, their language. So both in Greek and Indian records, they have Porus listed as an exceptional warrior. He was a tall, powerful figure. Alexander came from Macedonia and he swept east, as you said, he conquered Persia, lot, large parts of Asia, and even Northeast Africa. And it's said that he even planned to take the Arabian uh, territories, but, but he died before that. So Porus and Alexander, these two powerful personalities came head to head and clashed at what we call now the Battle of the Hydaspes. So the Battle of the Hydaspes was a very important battle in India's character and how India develops onwards. So the battle was fought by Alexander and Porus at the Jhelum River. It's called the Battle of Hydaspes because that's the name the Greeks gave it. And you can imagine the setup of the battle. You had a river that basically blocked off Alexander's path into India. You had Porus's army set on one side, Alexander's armies on the other side. And it was a big mental game. Not just they clashed many times, but it was a game of how Porus had to ensure Alexander did not cross this river. Alexander would move his men. He would do feints. He would fake. He would pretend as if he's going somewhere, he would go somewhere else. And Porus had to keep on ensuring that Alexander does not cross that river. But Alexander, out of a bit of luck, but mostly out of his strategic knowledge, he managed to cross over the river. And he attacked the sides of Porus's army, which were much weaker than Porus's center. So this led to a full-on war, which was Alexander took the victory, but it was a very costly Macedonian victory. And it was said that when Porus was fighting in this war, he was fighting till the last man. His intention was to die fighting. So then the Greek soldiers came and told Alexander that, look, this guy, he's not, he doesn't, he's not stopping. So after they tried to convince him, convince him, convince him, finally Porus, it said he got thirsty. That's why he stopped. And then when Alexander heard that Porus stopped and was coming to meet him, Alexander came out of his camp and these two legends met each other. And this is where the le legend says that Alexander asked Porus, how do you want me to treat you? And Porus said, I want you to treat me as a king would treat another king. So that won, that won Alexander Porus's respect. Porus won Alexander's respect in that format. 
and Alexander gave Porus control of his uh, kingdom back and made Porus his satrap. So Porus still had control of the lands that he was ruling. That's how Alexander maintained his huge kingdom. He would place people to rule on his behalf because obviously there was no telephones and stuff to maintain such a large kingdom as we saw before. Alexander's kingdom stretched all the way from Greece and Europe to India and he swept through the entire uh, southern, southwest part of Asia. So Alexander's army actually mutinied because Alexander's intentions wasn't just to stop with Porus. As, as we said, he wanted to take all of India. So there's a message here that was written, a historical writing that says that after the struggle with Porus, the Macedonians' courage was blunted and they heard rumors that this was just a small kingdom and there was a larger kingdom that was at wait, ready for them to come in. So because Alexander had to give in to the wishes of his uh, soldiers and his soldiers were tired after a long struggle. They went all the way from Greece and they came all the way to India they had to fight their way through some of the most powerful empires of the time. So therefore, Alexander turned back and the territories he had stayed under Greek control for a while. So now, what was this empire basically that scared Alexander, not Alexander, scared his men to the point in which Alexander was forced to leave. This was the Magadh Empire, which is ruled by the Nanda dynasty under a certain figure that's important coming up is Dhananand. Yeah, and Alexander left India and on his way back to Macedonia, he died in Babylon. So now Chandragupta Maurya becomes very important in our story. Chandragupta Maurya was born into this type of political atmosphere. Northern India was weakened by Macedonian invasions and Magadh was the main power that was ruling India at that time, especially in the north. So there are many debated origins for how Chandragupta Maurya came up. Some people believe that Chandragupta Maurya, he was of a lower class, he used to be a servant or a slave. Some people believe he was a warrior. He was part of a warrior class of the people Ivan warrior class, but they had fallen on hard times. So therefore he was, he didn't have the power that he usually would have had. And I said, Chandragupta looked up to Alexander the Great a lot. In India, Alexander the Great is sometimes called a Sikandar, as like the conqueror. So Chandragupta took a lot of inspiration from Alexander the Great's conquests. And the story about Chandragupta Maurya cannot be completed at all without the story of Chanakya, which we'll also talk about, one of the greatest and most intelligent minds we've ever seen come out of India. So Chanakya resided in Takshashila, which was a well-renowned, world-renowned university at the time. And Chanakya, upon seeing Alexander the Great's invasions into India, realized that India needed to be united in order to resist foreign invasions and foreign invaders that wanted to loot India's wealth and India's riches. So that was Chanakya's mission going into it, that Akhand, Akhand Bharat mission. He wanted India to be united against political invasions. So Chanakya was also known as Kautalya or Vishnugupta. One of the two most important books that he's ever written was the Atta Shastra and Chanakya Nithi. So Atta Shastra was a book mainly for kings, for people of the royal class. It was a book on economics, on statecraft, on politics, on how military strategies to be. Almost anything you would need as a king in that time, he had it. Spies, how to maintain your ministers, how to choose positions for certain people, what type of people to keep around you, how you should attack a certain type of enemy, where you should give up, where you should pretend to give up, but do this type of attack. Anything you would need is found in the Arthur Shasta as a king. And the Chanakya Niti was more for common people. It was for people like you and me. And it talked a lot about ethics. It talked about, it talked about how one should live their life according to their professions, according to a happy married life, a householder life. It went on and on and on about ethics for common people. So Chanakya's mission, as you said, was the Akhand, Akhand Bharat mission. So he went to Magadh. As we remember, Magadh was the empire that was so huge that Alexander was forced to leave India. So he went to Magadh because he thought if he could get Dhananand to join with Chanakya, they, they could join together with Chanakya's intelligence and an already powerful empire, they could take the entirety of India and achieve the mission of a unified Bharat. But unfortunately, when he got to Magadh, Dhananand insulted him. He insulted Chanakya. He insulted Chanakya's intelligence. 
and he completely dismissed the idea of a unified India. Because if you think in that time, India was kind of like Europe today, where there's a variety of different types of people. Uh, for someone else, we all look the same, but there's different languages, there's different cultures, there's different variations in religion, and on and on and on. So Dharanand felt it was impossible. This is a stupid idea. He completely dismissed the idea. And he said, yeah, I'm already a king of a really powerful empire. So he saw no need in it. So legend says that this, when Chanakya was insulted by Dharanand, he took his lock of hair and usually it's tied. So he untied his lock of hair and he swore that he will only tie his hair back once Dharanand is defeated and Chanakya sees his end. So that was the conviction of this man. He was sitting in the courtroom of one of the most powerful kings of India and he told him on the face that by his honor that he was going to ensure that he, he'll finish his story. And then there was a story that Dhananand tried to capture him but Chanakya escaped and then Chanakya had to go on the run for a while. So now the big story of how our two characters meet, Chandragupta and Chanakya. So Chandragupta was said to be playing in a forest with his friends. He was a young, he was a young chap. He was playing in the forest with his friends and Chanakya was passing by. And legend says that Chandragupta and his friends were playing a role-playing type of game that kids typically play. But Chandragupta was the king and all his friends would come with their people. And back then, how today we have like the executive, we have the president, and we also have the judicial, we have the Supreme Court. Back then, the king had power over both. The king was also the judge and he had judicial powers as well as executive powers. So Chandragupta was the king and they were, they were playing this make-believe game. And Chandragupta was basically solving the problems of his uh, fellow classmates, his fellow friends. So Chanakya saw and he saw the ingenious ways Chandragupta's mind was already tuned towards politics. How he was handling the situation, how he knew the right decision to make at a young age without any training or whatsoever. So that's how Chanakya felt that he was going to take Dhananandan, he was going to unite all of India, and he was going to put Chandragupta as the king. So this is how Chanakya took off with this concept of a unified Bharat, and how Chandragupta eventually joined Chanakya in this mission. So here's some quotes of Chanakya that are from both the Arthashastra and the Chanakya Niti. It's just a tip of the iceberg as to the reservoir of knowledge that's present in both those texts. One is, even if a snake is not poisonous, it should pretend to be venomous. This referred to a king in the military or just someone in, anyone in common day life as well. So this was something that was used. It was a concept that was used by many successful military generals, many successful kings all around the world. An example would be first like George Washington. So George Washington, when the, America, when Amer the American colonies were revolting against the British, George Washington was not in a good spot because taking on the largest colonial empire of the world back then, which was the British, George Washington had to think outside of the box. So there were many occasions in which George Washington would spread rumors that he had so much gunpowder, his men had so many guns and gunpowder that he didn't know what to do with it. In reality, they barely had enough. And they would use that to scare the British and to make the British fight on their terms, even though the British had far superior military power than George Washington did. So that's the concept behind that one quote. And the second quote is the self-interest between every friendship. There's no, so these are many quotes that Chanakya propounded for a happy life and a successful life. And then they had their campaigns against Dhananam. So now Chandragupta Maurya and Chanakya have joined together and now they've started their mission of taking down Dhananam and replacing his power his power with the Mauryan Empire. Essentially, they want to decapitate the head of the current Nanda government. And obviously, this empire, as you can see, is a huge empire. Today, it would stretch, it covers Bangladesh, it touches even Myanmar, all of Nepal, and even into Pakistan, and a good amount of northern India. So it is not a force, it was not a small force, it was a force to be reckoned with. So in order to do this, even in the Arthashastra, Chanakya writes on the importance of an intelligence network, on spies. He puts a lot of emphasis on information. He believed information was very critical to win wars. That even if you had less men or disadvantages, if you had more information than the other person, 
you had a lot of you had a lot to work with. You had a huge many advantages. And then obviously the Nanda Empire, this is their at their peak, they had two hundred thousand soldiers, eighty thousand cavalry, eight thousand chariots, and six thousand war elephants. So it's a massive force. Imagine if today you just got up and decided I'm going to overthrow the United States, something crazy like that. People would laugh at you. But this man, this one man decided that he was going to replace an entire massive empire that was existing at the time. So they had initial losses because their strategy was to go for Dhananand and finish it as quick as possible, effectively. So if you can see, Pataliputra was the capital of Magad, was the capital of the Nanda Empire. So Magadha's capital was Pataliputra. They launched a lot of attacks and they launched a huge attack on Pat Pataliputra. The problem, what happened when they launched attack on Pataliputra is they were defeated, obviously, because you can see the sheer size of this military. So this was a very disastrous war for Chanakya and Chandragupta. It led to Chandragupta's mother being captured and she was killed. And not only did Ch Chandragupta lose his mother, for a while even Chanakya himself was captured. But Chanakya being Chanakya, he intelligently managed to escape. Now you have the Maurya Nanda war. So now they had to completely change their strategy. So now there are legend will say a lot of these comes from legends and it's mixed with historical records. So you have to take a bit of it with a grain of salt, but the concept of it still rings true. So the legend basically propounds that when Chandragupta and Chanakya, they had to go on the run for a while. They had to go undercover. They had to make sure no one saw them. They had to lay low for a while after this last crushing defeat. And it said in a village they were hiding out, they saw a mother that was feeding her child. And this mother that was feeding her child, the child touched a bowl of kichri and the child burned his, his arm. So the mom said, what's wrong with you? Why would you touch the center of the plate of kichri? Eat around it. By the time you get to the center, it will anyways be cool. So this was said to have inspired Chanaki to change his tactics. Instead of going straight for Pataliputra, he started going for all the kingdoms outside to break the Nanda Empire out piece by piece by piece. So according to the Murda Rakshasa, this is a text that was written about this time. First, Chandragupta seized Punjab and Alexander's satraps that he left in Northwest India. Remember, we mentioned how he left satraps to rule for him, like how he left forests behind. So in this territory is a good amount where Alexander used to rule. So first, the first move Chandragupta made was first he seized all that territory and also present-day Punjab. And eventually, he gradually began to eat his way around the Nanda Empire. So this was, super, this was successful enough to the point that finally, the Nanda Empire was weakened enough that they could do a direct siege on Pataliputra. So they went back to the strategy they had before after weakening the Nanda Empire. In the year 320 BCE, it said in the year 320 BCE, Chandragupta was around perhaps 20 some years old. So he's a very young guy in over many years that was trying to overthrow this entire empire. So imagine the amount of conviction someone needs to have to dedicate their life to something like this. They relied heavily on certain tactics, guerrilla tactics. They would attack quickly and run. They had many allies too, the king of Simapura, the king of Kalinga. Kalinga is right here. And they relied heavily on mercenaries and they used all sorts of tactics. And as we mentioned, Chanakya had a lot of in emphasis on spies. So they made sure they had their spies everywhere. They made sure they knew what moves Dharananda was going to make. And eventually they broke it down to the point where they managed to seize Pataliputra itself. And then the Maurin Empire was established. So the aftermath of this was that Chandragupta became the king and Chanakya became Chandragupta's prime minister. So these two faced, they faced revolts, they faced assassination attempts and much, much more. Because it's not simple. You just take away Dhananand and you take the empire. A lot of people will be popping up trying to take advantage of it, of this power vacuum that's not created. You see a lot in movies, they'll say, oh, the power vacuum is gone. This top guy is gone. Now a lot of people are fighting for that top position. It's like that. That happens a lot in history. We'll see a lot, especially in Indian history. When a huge empire falls, there's always ambitious people trying to take the place of that empire. And there's always people that are always hiding and trying to preserve their borders as well. People that are not as ambitious. So the two main characters that popped up against Chandragupta and Chanakya were Amatya Rakshas 
and Malaketu. Amatya Rakshas was very loyal to Dhananand. He was Dhananand's prime minister. He was his prime minister and he was very cunning, he was shrewd and he was a very apt administrator. Malaketu was a ruler in the north, in India, that Chandragupta took help for, but due to some squabbles, Malaketu broke away and he demanded Chandragupta give him a lot more territory and Chandragupta was ready to give him. So this way Amatya Rakshas and Malaketu found each other and joined by the hate for Chandragupta and Chanakya, they started revolting against the Mauryan Empire now. So the way Chandragupta and Chanakya dealt with this was incredible. It was a, it was a sheer display of Chanakya's incredible strategy and his incredible intellect. So the first thing they did was Chandragupta and Chanakya pre pretended to have a fight with each other and they pretended to break apart. Chandragupta threw Chanakya out and then they stripped him of his role of a prime minister and Chandragupta said, made sure everyone could hear because news spreads a lot when the king and the prime minister are fighting publicly. Chandragupta said, you are no longer my prime minister. If only Amatya Rakshas I could have him, I would rather have him be the Prime Minister than you. So they faked this whole argument. After faking this whole argument, Chanakya's spy network, once again, coming into play, Chanakya's spy network made Malaike to believe that Amatya Rakshas was now going to join Chandragupta, since Chanakya was out of the picture. So because of this, Malaike and Amatya Rakshas had an actual rift between them. As Chandragupta and Chanakya pretended to have a rift between them, their plan led to Malaketu and Amatya Rakshas turning away from each other. Then after that, they were, Chanakya and Chandragupta, now that they've split their enemies apart, they did the tactical divide and conquer idea. They went against Malaketu and what they, Chanakya's spy network again, made Malaketu now believe that five allies, that the five allies that Malaketu was relying on in order to revolt against Chandragupta, he made Malaketu believe those five allies were actually working for Chandragupta. And then Chanakya's ruse eventually caused Malaketu to actually believe this lie and Malaketu killed these five allies. He killed his own allies thinking that they were Chandragupta's allies. So this Malaketu story was done. His revolt was dead. There was no chance of him revolting against the Mauryan Empire. And after this, Amatya Rakshas finally agrees and becomes the prime minister for Chandragupta. And it's believed Chanakya retired after this and he eventually went and he meditated until death. Now, there are many, actually, there's many theories for what happened to Chanakya afterwards, but he retired from politics. But during this whole thing of assassination attempts, of revolts, before Amatya Rakshas finally dropped his whole revolt, revolting business, Chandragupta's wife, Durdara, was poisoned, either by Amatya Rakshas, but by somebody who didn't like Chandragupta and the new Mauryan Empire. So what happened was the initial intention was to kill the king. It was to kill Chandragupta. But on this particular day, Chandragupta and his wife Durdara were sharing a meal. Were sharing a meal and Chanakya found out that there was a poison, poisoning attempt, an assassination attempt on the king. So by the time he rushed in there, rushed into the room to stop Chandragupta and Durdara, they had both already started eating food. What Chandragupta didn't know was that since Chandragupta had initially met with Chanakya, before they had even began the uh, conquest of the Nanda Empire and the revolt against the Nanda Empire, Chanakya in training Chandragupta would put little, little amounts of poison in Chandragupta's food to the point where Chandragupta was immune to these types of poisons. So Chandragupta survived, but unfortunately, since Chandragupta and the queen were sharing a meal, it was sure that Durudara was going to die. And not only that, the entire future of the Mauryan Empire was at risk because Durdara was pregnant as well. The heir of the kingdom was now at risk. So what Chanakya did was the conviction and the amount of the calmness and the clear-headedness you need to act in this situation is incredible, but Chanakya did. What he did was he immediately took out a knife and on the spot, he performed a C-section on the queen and he took the child out. And the child's name was Bindusara. It's believed he's called Bindusara because it said a, a drop of poison as Chanakya was removing the baby from the womb had fallen on Bindusara's head and there was a blue patch. So that's Bindusara. That's from where they believe his name came from. 
So this was the extent of the Mauryan Empire by the time Chandragupta Maurya passed away. You can see the sheer size of it. Later on, Bindusara, Ashoka, his descendants would eventually take Kalinga, would exert, not directly take control of, but exert their influence over the south as well. And they would even spread more towards the northeast. So this was the largest empire that ever existed in India, bigger than the British Raj, bigger than the Mughal Empire, bigger than modern day India. And there was a huge significance to this because the story is not yet done. But before we go on to what happens next, we should think about India's wealth in that time. Because today's India is obviously not, the wealth of today's India is not something to be especially proud of. But if you want to look just in the last 2000 years, how India's wealth has depreciated, we can see from this chart right here. It's a very good chart. So the Mauryan Empire happened around 300, 200 BC. So it's about three to 200 years before this chart. But you can get an idea. Many historians, many economists agree that this, this blue line right here is the line that shows India's wealth. Many economists, many historians believe that this line would have simply continued growing upwards. So they would have been even more wealthy back then. For context, today's United States has about 20% of the world GDP. GDP is a way of measuring the economic, economical wealth of a country. So US today is to around 20% of the entire world's global economy. India back then, around the year zero, was 32-33% of the entire world economy and it's predicted it would have been even more during the Mauryan Empire times. So that's how humongously wealthy India was and something we have to understand. In order to see, in order to imagine what's happening in our, in our eyes, we cannot imagine India in this story of India as we would imagine India today. India back then was an incredibly wealthy empire. That's a lot of the reason why the Macedonians, the French, the colonial uh, invaders, the Turkic invaders, a lot of them came mostly for India's wealth. India was famously wealthy all across the world. So you can see how as India's wealth depreciated over time. You can see how India is slowly trying to reclaim its spot. So now we have to go back to Alexander the Great. So after Alexander the Great died, we had the Mauryan Empire spring up due to Chanakya and Chandragupta. But Alexander was great at conquering empires, but he was not good at properly maintaining them. So what happened was right after Alexander died, his generals began squabbling amongst themselves and there was a civil war that erupted. So this massive empire that Alexander the Great created split into these five parts. Out of these five parts, the most important one is this large chunk here that was ruled by Seleucus. Seleucus now had a vision that he wanted to complete what Alexander could not. In the civil war, Seleucus came out with so much land and now his intention was to march into India once more. Once again, probably for India's riches and India's uh, resources and so on. He wanted to achieve what Alexander the Great could not. He wanted that legacy, that power, whatever it was. His intention was now to march into India. This was the exact reason that Chanakya had this idea of a united India, of a united Bharat, and that came into play here. Because obviously in order to invade India, you have to deal with the one sole superpower of India, which was the Mauryan Empire, which following now results in the Seleucid Mauryan War. The Mauryan War, the Mauryan Empire was led by Chandragupta and Chanakya. The Seleucid Empire was, obviously, it was run by Seleucus. This was a war between them two. So you can see what historical predictions, what they predict, how the number of, how, how many soldiers each of them had. The Mauryan Empire was planned of a lack of infantry, 100,000 infantry, 30,000 cavalry, 9,000 elephants. The Seleucids were, planned, were said to have 250,000 infantry. So although the Mauryans were outnumbered, they had cavalry, they had elephants, the technology was slightly, slightly more advanced. So in this war, as we mentioned, Seleucus wanted to retake the previous Greek satrapies under Mauryan rule. If you remember, when Chandragupta revolted against Dhananand, he took Punjab first and he took those previous Greek satrapies that were under, that were under the rule of the, the previous Greek satrapies that Alexander left behind. So Seleucus, Seleucus wanted those back. So this war was a brutal war, but it led to a Mauryan victory. 
led to an Indian victory. And as per the terms of conditions to broker peace between Seleucus and the Mauryan Empire, Seleucus was forced to give up some lands. He gave away land all the way to present-day Afghanistan. That was, so he ended up losing a lot of land. He had to give his daughter to, in marriage to Chandragupta, Chandragupta to seal the alliance. This was very common uh, in politics back then. In order to have alliances, political alliances, you would give your daughter or the, queen, the, prince, the princess in marriage to the king in which you want to do an alliance with, if obviously the age is matched and stuff. It was a good way to ensure that kingdoms remain aligned by blood. And Chandragupta gifted 500 war elephants as a show of good faith to Seleucus. But the thing about these 500 war elephants was it might have meant just a gift from Chandragupta, but Seleucus used these 500 war elephants in campaigns against the West, in the Western world, where people might not have been used to fighting Indian war elephants. And a lot of victories Seleucus got due to these 500 war elephants. So after Chandragupta, we had his son Bindusara, and then eventually we had Ashoka. So Ashoka was the king that came afterwards. So this is after Chandragupta's time. So Chandragupta, Ashoka is written to be a very brutal, very cruel uh, emperor. He wanted to expand the empire more and more and more. He expanded the empire all across India, and he was completing this United Bharat uh, concept even more. And it was believed that when he was a prince, so back then in India, it was very common that the system was there was a king and this king would have many sons. And they would give these princes certain territories to rule over, to be governors for, as a way to test their capabilities, to see how capable they are at running things, how good of an administrator they are. So like that, like all his brothers, Ashoka was also given Ujjain to govern. And it said he governed really well. And but there were a lot of political factors, a lot of political people that were against Ashoka. They didn't like, they just didn't like Ashoka. So there was a revolt in Takshashila against the Mauryan Empire. So all these political forces forced the king to send Ashoka to put down this revolt with not enough men. The goals that these people had was they wanted to send Ashoka not as well prepared to take down the revolt. The people that were revolting had better capabilities than the capabilities they were sending Ashoka with. But despite that, Ashoka was a tactical, he was very brilliant tactically, and he managed to defeat this revolt and he put it down and he came back and he got a hero's welcome. As time went on, it was clear Ashoka would not get the throne just because of all these political factors that are playing against him. So he killed at least six other princes that he was related to that would have had any claim on the throne. And he seized the throne by force. There are Buddhist sources that exaggerate this a lot. There are some sources that even say, I believe they said 99 uh, princes were killed by Ashoka. So this obviously you have to take with a grain of salt because what the Buddhist sources sometimes like to do is they like to show Ashoka as an absolutely horrific human being before the war in Kalinga. Because after the war in Kalinga, Ashoka became a more compassionate. He adopted Buddhist values. So it suits a certain narrative by showing Ashoka as a really bad person before and he just became an enlightened great human being after adopting Buddhist values. But don't get me wrong, Ashoka was a very cruel, he was a very brutal type of person and a type of king and he did completely radically change after adopting Buddhist values and witnessing the carnage of the war of Kalinga. So the War of Kalinga was basically, as you remember, we saw in the map, you had the entire Mauryan Empire. That small territory next to the Mauryan Empire was not conquered. So Ashoka went to conquer Kalinga. In this war, it said 100,000 men and animals died and 150,000 more men and animals were taken as captive. So it was a very bloody war. It was a, full of carnage, full of destruction. And it said Ashoka went in the battlefield after the war and he saw this carnage and he just couldn't take it. He just couldn't believe the extreme levels of the blood, of the carnage, of how many people suffer and how many people died because of his action to invade this place, of his desire to invade this place. So this led him to adopt Buddhist values. So the thing about him adopting Buddhist values, he didn't just become a Buddhist and just proclaim peace. 
he adopted Buddhist values and he changed the way he ran his government in such a way that we remember his name even today. That the Ashoka Chakra is still part of the Indian flag and it's part of the, it's still a part of the country today. Because of that change, because of the moral character that he made a change around. And he sent a lot of Buddhist missions, missionary missions to Lanka, Sri Lanka, Kashmir, Gandhara, the Himalayas, even to the Greeks. The Greeks also adopted Buddhism. So what you need to remember is when Ashoka conquered this huge empire, this massive empire, as a lot of people, as America today is the hotspot for immigrants to go to, as a place of improving your lives, as it's a very wealthy place. Back then, the Greeks used the opportunity of Alexander the Great's huge empire to go from Macedon, to go from Macedon and Greek, to immigrate their way into India, to the northern Indian parts that Alexander controlled. So thousands and thousands of Greek settlers actually had immigrated to India by this point. In the northern India, today would be present-day Pakistan. There, a lot of Greeks and a lot of Indians actually coexisted. It's a very remarkable thing. It's a very cool thing to think, of, think about. Thousands of years ago, there were swaths of land in which Greeks and Indians lived side by side and their culture developed together. So yeah, so they sent all these missions everywhere. So, but like all empires usually do, the Mauryan Empire also fell into a decline. The Mauryan Empire lasted for a little over 100 years, 130 plus years. But there, there are multiple theorized reasons following Ashoka's rule. There was already a decline, which was eventually stopped and the Mauryan Empire disintegrated, which we'll get to. There was a lot of financial strain on managing the empire and the military. Because as you might know, the managing an empire is expensive. That's one of the main things about managing an empire. It's expensive. You need to keep expanding. You need to find ways to fund your empire. So once Ashoka took more peaceful measures, it's believed that the army was not being used as much as it should have. So there was wages being paid to the army, soldiers were being paid for work that was not worthy of that pay. So lots of money was going to the military for absolutely no reason. So this led to a lot of financial strains and things started breaking apart. A lot of local governors that were ruling in the Mauryan Empire were notoriously corrupt as well, it was believed, although that's a bit it's a controversial thing, but it's entirely possible. So there was a lot of financial decline in the Mauryan Empire. And there was political tensions as well following Ashoka's ad adoption of Buddhism. There were some, uh, some Hindu Brahmins and some lot of people were uneasy about Ashoka's statewide adoption of Buddhism because they were wondering if it would cut out their indigenous culture. So there were political tensions because of that as well. And finally, the last Mauryan king Bhradhartha Maurya, which came, he came after Ashoka. One day he went to see his military for a military uh, inspection to see his army. So when he was seeing, when Pushyamitra Shunga was showing the last Mauryan king his army, Pushyamitra Shunga was the general of the Mauryan Empire back then. So the general assassinated the king and seized power. And the Mauryan Empire disintegrated. And there we have this Shunga Empire that popped up in its wake. So now we go on to the Shunga Empire, which lasted for about 110 years. So as we've seen the backstory between the backstory between um, what led to the Shunga Empire, we had Ashoka's rule, the Mauryan Empire declined. Eventually, Pushyamitra Shunga killed the last brother of Maurya, the last Mauryan king, and seized power. And the entire Mauryan Empire disintegrated. Because something that devastating happens when the king has been assassinated and somebody else has taken power. Many people, as, as we said, when empires collapse, many people take opportunities to pop up. So we have the Satavanas, local princes, and the south, which is relatively untouched in comparison to the rest of the subcontinent. So because of this, there are new players that popped up and there's new conflicts, conflicts that popped up. So obviously our first player in this new story as of in this post Mauryan age is Pushyamitra Shunga. Pushyamitra Shunga went on a lot of Ashwamedha campaigns to secure his rule after seizing the Shunga empire. Because he was aware that simply by killing the th king, things don't just happen. It's not just, it's not a Disney movie tale where everything's happy after you beat the bad guy. As if you remember after Chandragupta and Chanakya beat 
Dhananand and took the Nanda Empire and became the Mauryan Empire. They had to face a lot of assassination attempts. They had to fight Amatya Rakshas, Malay Ketu, in order to secure the Mauryan Empire. Similarly, Pushyamitra Shunga also had to do that. And he went on a lot of Ashwamedha campaigns and performed a lot of Ashwamedha sacrifices. So the Ashwamedha sacrifices are even mentioned in the Mahabharata times. They were done by Yudhishthira. So a general grasp of the sacrifices, you have a, there's rituals performed and you have a horse. A horse that will essentially run around of its own accord, accompanied by the soldiers of the king who is performing the Ashwamedha campaign. So now we have these horse, you have this horse running around the, just running around every kingdom. So the horse doesn't know boundaries and all. So it will go in other people's kingdoms, other people's territories. Other kings will be aware that this, this fellow, this king is doing an Ashwamedha campaign. So now let's say you send, you perform an Ashwamedha campaign and your horse runs into my kingdom. I now have a choice. I can do nothing about it. If I do nothing about it, symbolically it means that I have submitted to your dominance, to your rule. However, if I want to challenge that, I can go and kill the horse or I can capture the horse and there'll usually be a war that follows. So the thing about Ashwamedha campaign, it's very easy, it's very effective. You don't have to have negotiations with kings. You don't have to threaten war and all this. Simply you send a horse and based on the other king's reply, things either you either take the control of that territory or you don't. So it's a very efficient way of expanding your empire. So Pushyamitra Shunga did this in order to secure his borders, to make sure he doesn't just fade into oblivion after assassinating the last Mauryan king. And this was Ashwamedha campaigns were done many, many times by a lot of ambitious people in ancient times, thousands and thousands of years ago. But in the last 1,000 years, it was only done twice. And it's a big establishment of sovereignty, especially amongst Hindu kings. And there was controversy on Buddhism with Pushyamitra Shunga. Now this is contested by modern historians and Buddhist sources. Buddhist sources say Pushyamitra Shunga was a huge persecutor of Buddhists. That he had um, rewards given for the amount of Buddhists you'd kill. And he, had, and he ordered many assassinations and many killings and burning down monasteries and certain not good things. But there are also historians today that said that those Buddhist sources perhaps might have been exaggerated in order to paint Pushyamitra Shunga as a bad ruler. Because there are also historical records of the Shunga Empire, which built huge Buddhist stupas, built huge Buddhist monasteries, and funded a lot of uh, Buddhist missionary work and certain things like that. So that's a controversy. Was Pushyamitra Shunga tolerant to the Buddhist or was he not? And you can do your own research on that and come to your own conclusions. So now this is one of the most interesting things of this time, something that we probably didn't even know existed. I didn't even know this existed for quite a while. But the Indo-Greek kingdom, and it was not just a small thing that existed. It was a powerful kingdom. So the previous satrapies of Alexander, as this is, as now the Mauryan Empire is gone, a lot of these satrapies are now independent from Mauryan rule. Previous satrapies of Alexander, as we said, a lot of Greek settlers came in during Alexander's time. From Macedonia, a lot of settlers came in, especially in this region. And this region was inhabited by Indian people already for thousands of years. So these Greek settlers, Greek immigrants came in and they started coexisting quite happily. A lot of their worldviews were exchanged, ideas were exchanged, architecture. If you go today, there's architectures in which cities were built with a fusion between Indian architecture and Greek architecture. It's truly remarkable and amazing. So the story of how the Indo-Greeks came up was the Euthymid dynasty. Sorry, I have no clue how to pronounce that. So essentially, the Greco-Bactrian state was this large and it was ruled by Demetrius. But Demetrius was assassinated by Eucrates and Eucrates seized the Greco-Bactrian state. He seized it from Demetrius and he made himself the ruler of the Greco-Bactrian state, this entire state. Using this political unrest as an, as an excuse and an opportunity, the Indo-Greeks broke away from the Greco-Bactrian state and they became independent. And in Indian sources, what we used to call the Indo-Greeks was the Yavanas. So a lot, a lot of sources, a lot of texts and stuff, when we'd say like the Yavanas attacking, now it's been understood that we're referring to the Indo-Greeks. 
And the remarkable thing about this is since these were previous satrapies of Alexander, the kings of the Indo-Greeks were all Greeks. So imagine a Greek king ruling over an, a kingdom of Indians and Greeks that coexist. And most of the Greek kings eventually became Buddhists. Because as we mentioned, Ashoka sent Buddhist missionaries everywhere, even to the Greeks. So one of the most significant Indo-Greeks in this time, this is our second character that we are introducing to our story now. We had Pushyamitra Shunga, post Mauryan age. Now we have Menander. Menander was a very important Indo-Greek king. And one important thing about him was he was Indian educated. So he was very well educated. So as today, as we see to like countries in the West, like Harvard, MIT, Yale, as we see these as the top universities in the world, similarly, Back then, all these top universities were predominantly in India. India was the educational capital of the world. There are many texts and autobiographies written by Chinese, Korean, Japanese, Malaysian, Indonesian uh, scholars and people who aspired for a better education that made life-threatening journeys to get to India. There was one account of a Chinese scholar who crossed the Himalayas in a very treacherous journey. He almost died. But he came to India in order to apply for a university in India. Similarly, there was also another Chinese scholar who had his autobiography, autobiography written down. He traveled to Indonesia. He learned Sanskrit there. And then he traveled to India in order to apply for university. So imagine the risk of the situation. Not only could you lose your life, but imagine you get to India and you're unable to get into the university you want. And one of the biggest universities of the time was Takshashila. This was actually the university in which Chanakya stayed. And he was a huge patron of Buddhism. He sponsored and Buddhist art, literature, tradition flourished in the Indo-Greek empire. And Mananda himself converted to Buddhism. So in the Indo-Greek kingdom, Greek and Indians coexisted, as we said, their worldviews, their beliefs, their opinions. And today in Sagala, which I believe is in present-day Pakistan now, you can see a fusion of Indian and Greek architecture. Sagala was the, the capital of the Indo-Greek kingdom. And you'll find the coins of the Indo-Greeks, one side will be written in Greek, the other side will be written in Pali. So now we have a new conflict. The main battles between two of the large and important empires of this time, the Indo-Greeks and the Shunga Empire. Mananda took, Mananda took the opportunity to now invade India. In order to invade India, the first kingdom he went for was the Shunga Empire. His goal was to push into the capital itself, like many others have done before, as we've mentioned, into Pataliputra itself, the Shunga capital. So now we have our two main figures that were rivals of each other. There were two political rivals and they went to war. It was the Shunga Empire trying to preserve its border sovereignty and the Indo-Greek Kingdom trying to expand its borders across the northern sphere of India. But by the time Menanda got to Pataliputra, as we said, Pushyamitra Shunga was performing a lot of these Ashwamedha campaigns to very vigorously uh, make his empire long, uh, larger. So Pushyamitra Shunga managed to push Menanda back. So Menanda pushed into the Shunga Empire but Pushyamitra Shunga managed to push Mananda back and Mananda didn't get much territory in India. An important battle was the battle on the Sindhu River where Vasumitra, Vasumitra is the grandson of Pushyamitra Shunga. He defeated the Greek cavalrymen, which was a Greek attack by Mananda. And this was an important event because this allowed Pushyamitra Shunga to complete his Ashwamedha Yajna, the Ashwamedha campaigns. And it solidified Shunga rule for the coming decades. And yeah, you'll notice that the Satavanas have been around for since the Mauryan times. So the problem with this is a lot of these empires exist at the same time, but each one of them is so deep. We'll get confused if we talk about all of them happening at the same time. So we'll come to the Satavanas later on, but just keep in mind that during all this story, all this drama that was happening, the Satavanas were also growing their power in the south. And there was a lot of significance of the Shunga Empire as well. A lot of art, education, philosophy, architecture flourished, both Hindu and Buddhist uh, counterparts. 
because as you said, as we said, Buddhist stupas, Buddhist monasteries, they were also built by the Shunga Empire. This, the Shunga Empire established the practice of royal power sponsoring art and education. So the government became involved in sponsoring artists, musicians, and these, uh, the arts of education. And they became very involved in these spheres of public interest. So they were sponsoring art. If you are an artist, you can be sponsored by the government. So this allowed Indian art, it established a tradition that the coming empires would also adopt, where you would sponsor the artist in your kingdom in order to make the cultural importance of your kingdom go up. There were a lot of developments in Hindu thought and literature particularly. And like always, there was a decline in the Shunga empire following Pushyamitra Shunga. And the Shunga Empire lasted for around 110 years, which is about 20 years less than the Mauryan Empire did. The Indo Greeks also declined, but they fell far after. You can see they used to have this entire territory, but now they only controlled about this much. Eventually, that too would go around 1080. So they would last for a couple hundred years more. And as in a form of karmic, uh, form of karma, I guess. As Pushyamitra Shunga killed the Mauryan king to seize power, similarly, Devabhuti, who was the king of the Shunga Empire, was assassinated by Vasudeva Kanva, and the Kanva dynasty was established. The Kanva dynasty were not going to go into because they, the Kanvas were not able to hang on to their empire as well as the Mauryans and the Shungas did. They fell apart in 45 years. And now we go to the Satavana Empire, Satavana dynasty, which lasted for three to 400 years, which is longer than the United States has lasted up till this point. They existed parallelly with the Shungas, the Kanvas, the Indian. Okay. So the Satavanas, we're not exactly sure. Historic question. Yeah, sorry? What does dynasty mean? Dynasty? So dynasty is essentially, it refers to a system of government in an empire or a kingdom in which people, according to families rule. So let's say if my grandfather ruled a kingdom, then if it was a dynasty, then his father would rule, then I would rule, then my son would rule, then his son would rule. It would go as per family. So power would, power would basically stay in a family. That's what that means. Does that answer your question? Okay. So yeah, Satwana dynasty lasted from about the 2nd century BC to the 3rd century CE. So it lasted from about 100-200 years before Christ all the way to 100-200 years after Christ. So the significance of the Satavana dynasty is because during their time, they were the first major Deccanese dynasty in the South. Now this word Deccanese will be used quite a bit to describe events in the South. The South is sometimes just called the Deccan. Basically, the Deccan is a mountain range that is around here. And the term is used interchangeably to describe the entire Southern part of India. So Indo-Roman trade also reached its peak here. This was very important because this was during the time when the Roman Empire was at its height. It was a massive empire that existed in the Western world. And the Romans wanted a lot of Indian goods. So a lot of Roman gold, a lot of Roman silver was funneling its way into India. And also the Satavanas managed to establish peace in the South and a majority of India for a, for a few hundred years. And like many powers before it, they had grants to religious monasteries and they were tolerant, like most major powers before, to various religions, various cultures that were within, with, within their borders. So here's a chart that shows the roots in which the Romans traded with India. So the Romans had power all the way down to Egypt. So they would use these routes to have goods go from here into Arabia, and eventually make their way into many different trade routes into the south of India and especially into the Satavana dynasty. 
So Indian trade, you have to understand, was something that a lot of people wanted. The British, the Portuguese, the Dutch, all of them came around the world simply on, under the premise of wanting Indian trade. Because Indian trade had the potential to make your kingdom very rich, or at least acquire a lot of the goods that India had. India had goods, products, textiles especially, clothes that were not found in the rest of the world. So the world, it was a luxury good that people wanted a lot. So yeah, Indian products, goods, resources, they were sought internationally all over the world. And there was an important scholar that ha existed in the Roman Empire, Pliny the Elder. So usually today's economists, they'll say trade is good, trading between countries is good. But Pliny was a complete U-turn of that. He disliked Roman trade with India because he said that hundreds of millions of uh, their currency back then, sorceries from the Roman Empire at a conservative estimate was going between India and Rome. A lot of Roman wealth was being poured into India in order to meet the demand for Indian goods by the Roman people and the Roman women. And he called India the sink of the world's gold, specifically for this reason. So the Satavanas can be 300, 300, 400 years can be broken up into a certain couple segments. So they existed well for a while. You can see they pushed their borders up, but their first decline happened because of the Western satraps. The Western satraps were an Indo-Scythian people. As like the Indo-Greeks, they're an Indo-Scythian people though. They're also called the Western Kshatrapas. That is more of an Indian term for them. And the important thing about the Indo-Scythians is, remember how we said the Indo-Greeks fell apart about 10 years after around 10 AD. These were the guys that finished the Indo-Greeks for good. So you can see as the Western Satraps invaded, the Satavana dynasty fell under their power. So if you see it's lightly colored in this color, essentially it means they did not have direct rule, but they had a lot of influence and a lot of power over everything that happened in this territory. Now we go to Gautami Putra Satakani. There was a movie on him as well, but he was one of the greatest empires of the Satavana dynasty. So the nature of Gautami Putra Satakani's name is you can notice his name Gautami Putra. This was common in the Satavahana kings. They would name their names would be Gautami Putra. They would have a Putra at the end. It would be after their mothers. So Gautami Putra's mother's name was Gautami. Putra means son. So essentially his name translates to son of Gautami. This is very common in uh, the Satavahana kings. They, their names would be based off their mother's names. Yeah, it ran away. And he, yeah, he was the greatest Satwana emperor. And after this first decline, when the Western satraps invaded the Satwana dynasty, it was Gautami Putta Satakarni that revived the power. You can remember how all this was subjugated by the Western satraps. He pushed the Western satraps back. He went to war with Nahapana. Nahapana was the king of the Western satraps at that time. And he defeated him. He retook a lot of lost land from the Western satraps, as we saw from here. And he fought many neighboring kingdoms in order to consolidate the borders and the core of Satavana power. But then there was a second clash and a second decline that happened afterwards. Following Gautami Putra Satakani's life, there was another clash that happened with the Western Satraps, the second Western Satraps invasion. The second invasion was done by a man called Rudra Daman. He invaded the Satavana dynasty when it was under Vasishtiputra Kullumavi which is, he, uh, Vasishtiputra was the son of Gautami Putra Satakan. Son or the grandson? It's a big debate on who was the king of the Satwana Empire then. But regardless, the Western satraps defeated the Satavanas and Ruddhadaman spared the Satwana king out of mercy. But then there was another revival. As Gautami Putra revived the Satavanas the first time around, this Yagna Satakani revived the Satavanas the second time around. So the second time he revived them, there was a brief revival, but Yagna Satakani did not do as good of a job as Gautami Putra Satakani did. So after he died, the empire went into decline. They just went into decline. Eventually, they fell apart. They were not invaded per se, but they fell apart from within. 
but the western satraps continued to remain powerful for 200 years onwards so the satavahanas ended around 170 190 around 200 ce so 200 years after the death of christ so that's the time frame in which we're on so you can see this is 450 ce so following the post satavana dynasty the western satraps were powerful for 200 years but then now we have a new player that comes up which is a gupta empire the gupta empire is just as it can be argued that they might be even more important than the empires we've talked about so far because the gupta empire rose and became india's major power around the third century ad to 543 ce and this is called as the golden age of india already we've been talking about how infam famously wealthy india was how much wealth they had how people desired that wealth but this was a golden age we went even further in terms of advancements and innovations in architecture science technology engineering art language mathematics astronomy and on and on and on so i have included a picture here that was made by the gupta empire just imagine that this was done thousands of years ago by indian architects this place commemorates the place of the place where buddha achieved enlightenment Buddha achieved enlightenment. So the Gupta Empire was started by a man called Gupta. Just as Chandragupta Maurya's empire was called the Mauryan Empire, uh, they enjoyed attaching their names to their empires, I guess. But it was started by a man called Gupta. He was the founder of the Gupta dynasty. And you can see how insignificant the Gupta Empire was at its early stages. And the Gupta was believed to be a Vaishnavite, but like most Hindu kings in this time, he was religiously tolerant to other religions. As we saw here, it was under the Guptas that this monument was built to commemorate the place of Buddha's enlightenment. And he built this temple for Chinese pilgrims. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it. There's also a Chinese name for this, which for sure I cannot pronounce. Uh, but it's a glorious temple that was built for Chinese pilgrims. So it shows India and China also had a lot of uh, trade, they had a lot of connections, cultural connections, mostly because of Buddhism. So now we are going to talk about one of the greatest conquerors that ever lived in India, Samudra Gupta. He was very important. There's a, bit of, there's a bit of a dispute as to when he lived, either 335, 350, but we know he died around 375. So it's believed that he was born around 335, he took power around 350. Regardless, uh, we, we don't know. Historically, we have no idea. He was the great grandson of Gupta, who was the founder of the Gupta Empire. And colloquially, especially in European context, he's called as the Napoleon of India. Although, suppose we should call Napoleon the Samudra Gupta of France, because not only was Samudra Gupta alive thousands of years before Napoleon was, but unlike Napoleon, Samudra Gupta was undefeated in battle. Samudra Gupta spent a big amount of his life fighting war after war after war, and he didn't lose a single one of them. And he too performed the Ashwamedha sacrifice. So you'll see this as a bit of a trend. And to big make your empires, to make your empire's desires to fit your ambitions. If you're a very ambitious person and you want your empire to expand and you feel you have the means to do that, a lot of people went ahead with Ashwamedha sacrifice. And another thing that's mentioned is he was a very accomplished poet and a musician. He could play a variety of musical instruments. And he was a very accomplished poet. Here's a coin that was been excavated during his time. So this portrays uh, Samantha Gupta in a very majestic form. And he aspired to become the Chakravartin or the ruler of the entire Indian subcontinent. That was his aim. That was his goal. So this picture itself highlights the importance, the significance, and the achievements of Samudra Gupta. This was the empire at which when Samudra Gupta took the reins of the empire. And by the time he died, by the time he died, within just 40 years, he managed to turn this into this massive empire that stretched all across India. And at this point, the Western satraps were very much weakened by the Gupta Empire. And they were just existing kind of at the mercy of the Gupta Empire. So you can see how 
today's Kashmir, all the way until today's Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and down south as well. It's all been taken by the Gupta Empire. And now afterwards, we have the son of Samadhi Chandragupta II, which thankfully was as capable as his father. Because we'll see many times in history, just because a historical figure was great doesn't necessarily mean their sons or their sons were great. But luckily for the Gupta Empire, Chandragupta was just as capable as Samadhi Gupta was. So Chandragupta, there's no relation to the Mauryan Empire, Chandragupta Maurya. That's one thing we should remember. Chandragupta II is there's no relation between the two. Chandragupta II happens hundreds and hundreds of years after Chandragupta Maurya. Now Chandragupta II continued the military expansion of his father. Samadragupta wished to rule all of the Indian subcontinent. Chandragupta kept that vision going, that dream going. And one thing Chandragupta did, one of the most significant things he did was he crushed the Western satraps. Because if you remember, we mentioned that even though the Satavahanas declined, the Western satraps continued 200 years after that. This was the end of that 200 years. And not only that, he had influence over the Vakataka dynasty as well. Because his daughter, Prabhavati Gupta, was a queen of the Vakataka dynasty. So therefore, just because of that political alliance, indirectly, he had a lot of say in Vakataka politics. He had a lot of say in southern politics. So you can see here. So as we mentioned before, this lightly shaded part is places the Gupta Empire did not have direct administrative control, but they had an incredible amount of influence. So he solidified, Chandragupta solidified that power. Instead of just being under influence, he made sure all these areas were directly under the control of the Gupta Empire. And he even expanded the Gupta Empire's influence on the Northeast in Assam. And in Karnataka as well, he influenced, he increased the influence and the power of the empire in the south. And as we can see, these western satraps were completely crushed by the Gupta Empire. And this was the empire I mentioned, the Vakataka dynasty, that Chandragupta's daughter was a queen of. So therefore, just by that relation, Vakataka politics could be tilted in a certain way by the mercy or by the decisions of Chandragupta. So in a way, he had influence over this entire, entire piece of India. So a few innovations that happened because of the Guptas is chess. Obviously, chess is a huge innovation that uh, spread from India all over the world. And we have the Sushruta Samhita. The Sushruta Samhita, here is a statue we have Sushruta. This statue of Sushruta shows, of, shows Maharashi Sushrut. He is the founding father of surgery. So one thing you have to understand during this time is, in India, scientifically, India was very advanced compared to the rest of the world. India, and particularly Greece. We see Greece as a cradle of Western civilization. India was like that, but in the East. So during this time, in the Sushruta Samhita, Maharashi Sushrut wrote an entire piece wrote an entire literature on medicine, Ayurveda, and they made innovations on surgery. They didn't discover surgery, they made innovations on surgery. So this means that even before this time, keep in mind this is around 400, 500 CE, is when they made innovations in surgery, even before this, that it's possible that surgeries were happening in India thousands and thousands of years ago. And a lot of it was due to the innovations that propelled that science forward by Maharishi, Sushrut. And Aryabhata was obviously a man that at least should perhaps be familiar to us. He made many advancements on astronomy. He studied solar and lunar eclipses. So we all know the big story of how the West, the church had to come in terms in the West thousands of years from now with the fact that the earth is not flat, but it's round. Then you had Copernicus, you had Galileo. They all had to fight and they were all persecuted badly by the church for their beliefs that the earth was round. But during this time, it was already mentioned in the Rig Veda that the earth was not flat, but it uh, propounded that it was round. But Aryabhata built a lot off of these theories. Aryabhata went on and he said that the earth is not only round, but the sun is in the center of the solar system, which was a theory that was already mentioned beforehand, 
Raja Bhatta corroborated with it. He said the sun was in the center, and on not on top of that, he said the earth not just didn't just revolve around the sun; it revolved on an elliptical orbit. So if you know the earth doesn't just revolve like this; it revolves on a tilt, a tilt on the axis. So somehow, thousands of years ago, Raja Bhatta made advancements on the fact that the earth not, was not only round, but it had this type of elliptical orbit. And also on solar and lunar eclipses, he had a lot of studies done on solar and lunar eclipses. Talked about the effects of those, how those are formed, how habitually they happen, and on and on and on. Also during this time, it's believed that zero might have already been invented, but it was popularized more. So there were a lot of mathematical inventions that grew on the foundation of India's invention of zero. And on top of that, there was a systematic, very advanced creation of a decimal system. Of a decimal system, which went on talking about a decimal, basically an advanced decimal system, which allowed an organization for the economy, for finance, for architecture, and on and on and on. And it allowed the Gupta Empire to be this cradle for a, a melting pot of Indian innovations that would differentiate India from the rest of the world when it came to scientific and human overall human development, because. India was advanced in almost every field of study. That was one thing that made India different. There was a huge emphasis placed on research, on continuous research. And the difference between India and the West when it comes to this is to maybe easily understand, is in the West typically over thousands of years, there was a clear distinction between science and religion. And a lot of times those clashed. But in India, a lot of the religious teachers like Madhushri, Shishrut, and a lot of religious, a lot of saints, a lot of rishis, were the same people who made a lot of the scientific advancements due to their austerities, due to their capabilities. They were the ones who made the scientific advancements that spread all across India. And there was much, much more. But unfortunately, once again, the Gupta Empire also fell into a decline. And this decline marked the end of the golden age of India. The, or, it didn't mean India just suddenly fell into a decline or anything, but it was the Gupta Empire's cradling of Indian culture, of Indian innovations that stopped. The research that happened to the extent at which it happened in the Gupta Empire did not happen following the Gupta Empire. That's the main thing what they mean when the golden age was over. So there was a slow decline following Chandragupta II himself. There was a slow decline, which is hastened by the invasions of the Hana. The Hanna, you might remember from movies like Mulan and them, when the Huns invaded China. So the, the Hanna is also another name for the Huns. But these were not the same Huns that invaded China. These were called as the White Huns. These were like the White Huns that invaded uh, the Gupta Empire. And they invaded the Gupta Empire after the Gupta Empire's uh, big main conquerors and leaders. So the Hanna invaded after Samadhi Gupta. They invaded after Chandragupta II. And the leadership in the Gupta Empire was not as capable as it was under those two main figures. So the Hanna were able to invade the Gupta Empire. And you can see this part used to be, as we mentioned, this like present-day Kashmir was very much under Gupta control. The Hanna broke free, broke free and they began their conquest into the Gupta Empire. But the, the, this led, as you can see, the Gupta Empire has completely broken apart in the first map and the second map. They lost control of many territories all across the north, all across the west, and they lost their influence in the northeast as well, and also the south. The Vakatakas were relatively untouched though, but they also did not survive for long after this period. But after the Hannas invaded and the Gupta Empire fell apart, just like we see over and over again in history, when this big empire falls apart, many ambitious people pop up. One of these ambitious people was the King of Malwa, right here. King of Malwa, which used to be under Gupta rule, but became independent following the Hanna invasions. King Yashodharman of Malwa. Important thing about King Yashodharman is that he, and it's predicted that the Gupta Empire also helped him in this, uh, in this mission, but he waged war against the Huns. He waged war against the Huns, and eventually he was one of the main reasons why the Huns were thrown out of India. And there was a there was a theory by the British that the Huns came, mingled, and mixed in Rajasthan. But that's disputed as a colonial theory meant to undermine the greatness of 
Indian culture, whatever. So the Gupta Empire was left very much damaged and it eventually fell apart by 550 CE. So right here, this map is 513 CE. Just a few decades after this, the Gupta Empire ceased to exist. So after this period, what we're going to go over for the next for next week is right now we went over from the period of 300 BC, we went all the way through the year zero and we went all the way through 500 C. So we went, up, we went through about 800 years of history, like a crash course of 800 years of history. Following 513 CE, we are going to skip ahead a bit to like 800, 900 CE, where we talk about the rise of the Cholas and it's the beginning stages of the Islamic invasions in India. And we call it the Islamic invasion, but you can just as easily call it the Turkic colonial period because all it was Afghan Turkic tribes that came and invaded India. Because saying Islamic invasions, the today's Indian Muslims did not have anything to do with the invasions that happened during the Islamic invasion period. Because today we see movies of like Padmavat and stuff. We see Allahuddin Kilji. Allahuddin Kilji and these people would not have looked like Ranveer Singh or anything. They, to us, they would have looked like foreign people. They would have looked completely foreign to Indian people if, had we been living in that time. So that too was a set of foreign invasions by the Turkic tribes, which we'll have the Delhi Sultanate, we'll have the, the uh, Ghaznis, the Ghoris, then you have the Mughal Empire, and eventually the Marathas, and a lot of struggles against the Mughal Empire, which we'll be covering in the coming week. So essentially, yeah. So today, just as a recap of everything we went over, so we had the Mauryan Empire that propped up following Alexander the Great's invasions. Chanakya felt the need to unite India. Chanakya, Chandragupta revolted against Dhananand. They started the Mauryan Empire. Following that, they had a lot of troubles, but they established the Mauryan Empire. Down the line, you had Ashoka's reign. Then you had Pushyamitra Shunga, who assassinated the, assassinated the Mauryan king, started the Shunga Empire. And also the Indo-Greeks that popped up under Menander. Pushyamitra Shunga and Menander went to war. And then following the Shunga Empire, then we talked about the Satavana dynasty. Satavana has, Satavanas had war with the Western satraps, with Gautami Putra as one of the greatest kings. Then following that, we have the Gupta Empires, which we just talked about, which was the golden age of India. So that's pretty much all we Ooh. have. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Chinmay. As, as you guys, like, as you can see, right, this, this amount of research that, research that has been gone in, countless hours have been spent in like in researching the history books and trying to find out this minute details of like, you know, Ch Chanakya Niti or Shushruta Samhiti and, you know, all the other details that like, you know, about the Indo-Greek war, even I was not aware of that, but amazing. And I'm hoping that like, you know, everyone had a, you know, good understanding and, you know, enjoyed what, what it was presented. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to unmute and ask those questions. Or if you guys have any suggestions on like, you know, if, if there is any di different expectations from you from like, you know, what you have signed up, please let us know. Our, our goal was like, you know, to cover the in uh, Indian history. Ancient is a relative term, like, you know, how ancient can you go? This is as much ancient as like, you know, what we were planning to cover. So I hope like, you know, we are in lines with like, you know, what we have advertised for. And, you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? There are like so much more history that we could cover, but like, you know, it would take m about 40 weeks for us to be able to cover all that. And, you know, we, since we are trying to cover this in four weeks, we are trying to take the most important aspects of Indian history and cover this in these series. So I'm hoping that like, you know, you, you are learning and as well as like, you know, teaching your kids in, 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 in these sessions. If there are any questions, please feel free to ask. So one question that, uh, Ab Abhiram is asking, which empire ruled most of the India? Uh, yeah. Chinmay, you can take that. Yeah, so the empire that ruled most of India is that, I mean, if you go back to the Mahabharata and Ramayana times, you might have other views on the matter. But if you look back to like historical documents in which most historians agree on, it was the Mauryan Empire that ruled most of India. They were one and a half times bigger than the Republic of India today itself. They were bigger than the British Raj and they're bigger than any other contemporary empire. It was a Mauryan empire that was the, that was the big empire that ruled India. Cool. Yes, that's all the questions that we have. And yes, like, you know, we went about, you know, more than 20 minutes, but I'm hoping it's okay for all you guys. 
next week we are going to cover much more um, interesting topics about like the cholas dynasty and their the pallavas in uh, i was reading about the cholas like you know the amount of uh, uh, the navy that they had was immense in the current day of malaysia and indonesia and all those mine marsh like you know where ruled by the cholas and the their uh, subsidiaries at one point of a time so next week is going to be much more interesting like in you know, focusing more on the southern india part of it so see you guys next week thank you chinmay and, and you know thank you for all the effort that you have put in thank you and one last question what empire stayed strong the longest and has there been any records of war with chinese dynasties uh with chinese dynasties i'm not aware of any wars but during the chola empire times there was a lot of trade with uh, china a lot of chinese uh, uh explorers came to india they've written documents on how india is and what they like about india this was mostly done by the cholas who had a big naval uh, army they spread to southeast asia and with their navy they spread all around their nearby areas so it allowed a lot of trade from china to go back and forth from the chola empire and if you see on that graph that we showed like india as well during the time in which the chinese traded with india the chinese gdp share of the world actually went up a lot so the chinese benefited a lot from the cholan trade and there's one question what empire stayed strong the longest yeah um, i'm not exactly sure on that but the cholas lasted for well over 1000 years the chola empire lasted for a couple hundred years but as an entity the cholas although they fluctuated in strength over the years they lasted probably the longest thank you guys and we will end the session now thank you bye jai shri manarayan Jai Shri Manan and good job, Chinmay. The Thank session you. was very well done. Thank you. <laughs> Jai Shri Manan. Jai Shri Manan. Thank you. Bye. Jai Shri Manan.